feeling home when I'm here uh, and seeing many young people from very different countries sharing this ecumenical desire uh, for the church uh, and I would never have wanted to miss this. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here and I'm, I'm very aware that um, your energies are starting to come back after the day yesterday, <laughs> but it might take a while because it was of course a big, uh, a big effort that uh, people had to make to be part of this. And uh, we know that from Berlin, uh, where we had been together for four days already, there are quite a few people who didn't make it, who, who were simply so exhausted from those four days uh, that the image of going to Wittenberg by train, not knowing what to do with the luggage and not knowing how long to walk, and you had to walk for pretty long, uh, uh, did not really uh, motivate them to come to Wittenberg. So we were, I do admit, a little bit worried about the numbers. Uh, and all of a sudden, I don't know where they came from, but uh, they came. Uh, and so we had 120,000 people there, which is great. And, uh, um, uh, and I'm, I'm, so I'm very happy about uh, the day yesterday. And um, let me also tell you, it's just so wonderful. I mean, we were there uh, in front, uh, but we were not performing. We felt what we said. Tabo Makova is a wonderful man and his wife, by the way, too. Uh, not a man, a woman. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, all the people who celebrated the worship together, we hug each other. We, we are just one in Christ. We are. Uh, and, uh, and it's just uh, beautiful to, to have that experience with all the around of such a service, even though sometimes the nerves uh, have to be quite uh, strong. Uh, when you don't know whether certain things work and maybe when they don't work uh, and you have to deal with it. I'm sure you could tell maybe stories about that too. Uh, but then in the end we are celebra celebrating worship service together and we can put everything in God's hands. Everything that didn't work. And trust. Simply trust that all will go with God's help. And my feeling is it, it did go, <laughs> it, uh, it went well, uh, despite all the constraints that might, might have been there as well. So I'm happy to he be here this morning and speak about reform and reformation, reforming theology, reforming the church. And uh, when uh, this title comes to your mind, you, at least here in Germany, almost automatically think of a Latin phrase that's been quoted many times, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. Uh, the church always has to be reformed as a, a, a core um, expression of what reformation is all about. And I always thought, because it's Latin, it comes from reformation time. Uh, all these Latin phrases normally come from reformation time or before. But actually, I found out that uh, this phrase became popular only in the 20th century. Karl Barth used it. And then Hans Küng, the famous Catholic theologian, used it to talk about the reform of the Catholic Church. So it's not a Lutheran expression, but it could be. <laughs> it's like with the thesis and the door of, of the church. I, there are good reasons to think that he really hammered them on the church, but historians doubt it also. But he could have hammered them there. And it was a public act. And so uh, having this story around the core of what these theses were supposed to be, a, a call, a public call to witness, uh, I think it's legitimate to tell this story even though you don't know whether it's absolutely historical or only half historical. In the end, it doesn't really matter whether he hammered them or whether he published them. He did want these theses to spread and to be public. So, uh, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. Of course, it is uh, an expression of Reformation impulses. But maybe not because Luther said it or whatever else might be the reason connected with Reformation, but because it speaks to the core of what the church is all about. If it is really true that Christ is the center of the church, then of course the church must always change. 
Because the church as we believe it is the body of Christ. That's what we can read in Paul and that's what somebody like Dietrich Bonhoeffer has emphasized again and again. Bonhoeffer said the church is Christ existing as community. Christus als Gemeinde existieren. Now of course we notice that there are certain phenomena in the church, phenomena in the church that do not always remind us of Christ. Conflicts, sometimes jealousies, um, also uh, salaries that are very high or very low, at least very different, of, of very different height, and all these kinds of things that we know from the world. So if we say Christ is the center of the church and the church is the body of Christ, then how does this go together? So I think it is necessary and important to know what we talk about when we talk about the church. Of course, the church is also the empirical church, the church as we experience it, with employment contracts, with buildings that have to be kept up and need money and discussions about this and all the legal things around. This is all the church. Now, how do those two images of the church or those two understandings of the church go together? The church as we believe it, the body of Christ, and the church as we experience it empirically. In church history, in, in the history of theology, there have always been concepts that try to rip apart these two things. That said, well, the, the spiritual image of the church must be made strong. And the empirical thing, it's simply just like in the world too. We need law and all these things. Now, I don't think that is right. I think there must be a relationship between the church as we experience it and the church as we believe it. Actually, this is crucial. If we say we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and I've just said it too, it must have some visible dimension. And so I think the relationship between those two is crucial. The church, as we experience it, must again and again be measured and put in relation to the church as we believe. And if that is true, then we already have an absolute crystal clear answer to the question why the church is a church to be reformed constantly. Why Ecclesia Semper Reformanda? Because this is a dynamic process. We always have to look at the difference between the empirical church and the church as we believe it. And always change, always be put in question as a church, by the church as we believe it. And we can never be satisfied with some aspects of the church that seem to be in clear tension to the church as we believe it. So the, the general direction of our search is how can we be, become a church of brothers and sisters also in our institutional setting? What must be the rules within the church that make it possible for us to deal with each other in a brotherly and sisterly way? There will still be salaries, there will still be competences, and there will still be a boss that says to somebody else, this is what I expect of you. But I believe that even if that is necessary, we can deal with it in very different ways. We can speak about what this person has to do. When I'm a boss, I talk to my employee or to my brother who has another function. I would prefer that, uh, uh, that expression. And, and I try to understand his ideas and I give him my idea and tell him why I think this is what has to be done. You don't always have to time to talk that long before you make a decision. 
but uh, so there must be sometimes also orders or, or uh, something similar like that. But, but the core of leading in the church is in a transformative style. And transformative leadership, it's actually, you find it in the books on, uh, on, uh, uh, on companies and leadership. The psychologists have different styles of leadership and you find this transformative leadership style in the textbook. And that is, you tell people, you, you enthuse people for a certain content so they understand why it's wonderful to work that way and to do whatever it is. And I think that's a style that fits with us as the church because we are all enthused by Christ and we are all one in Christ. And that's why the Barman Declaration of 1934, the fourth thesis of the Barman Declaration, which was written against National Socialism and was the basis of the Confessing Church in the time of National Socialism, says there can never be a hierarchy in the church in the sense that there is a leader who orders uh, everybody else, but the, the way we lead must always be an expression of our common service, of our common service to Christ and then consequently to others. So this is one example and we could talk about many institutional aspects where we look for the right way to be the church also institutionally in order to reflect what we believe as the church, the body of Christ. So these are examples for the challenge and uh, I want to give you a few Reformation theology spots that might emphasize or might, might clarify a little bit and might uh, show how the church can be the church in our time today on the basis of these wonderful Reformation theology impulses. And you will see that when I talk about these themes, it is always something that, that relates to the church, as the church as the church and at the same time to the public and to the public dimension of what the church is called to do. Let me give you a few theological dimensions of what I mean. The first one is basically central because it is the first thesis of the 95 thesis of Martin Luther, which are the reason why we are here right now. Uh, we are celebrating 500 years of Reformation because uh, in 1517, Martin Luther published his 95 Theses. And the first of these 95 Theses contain thoughts and expressions that are not very popular today, especially not in public culture, especially not with people who are not so much within the walls of the church, but uh, look at it from outside and, and wonder sometime. And that is the word repentance. It's not one of the darling words these days, repentance, but it is crucial. It is timely as it couldn't be more timely. And I want, I want to give you an impression why. First of all, the, the, the thesis itself, and I don't have the English wording in my head, that's why I read it. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Apparently for Luther, this was absolutely central. And when I look at what is being discussed in this anniversary year, publicly especially, I kind of miss this expression. It's all about other things that I also will talk about later, but repentance is the first of the 95 Theses. This is the, the impulse, the first impulse for Reformation. So what can the word repentance tell us today? It's not difficult to, to understand why it is so important. Think of your own life. And every secular person understands what I mean. Look at your relationships. Look at the marriages that break down. 
Why is this happening? Because people lack the inner strength to look at their own fault, to look at their own part of the causes for the conflict. The failure of gaining self-distance, that would be the modern word now. That, everybody understands that one. It's nothing different. Repentance means that we have a regular place where we look at our dark sides, where we look at everything that separates us from our neighbor, our brother, our sister, our wife, maybe, our husband. A regular place and a basis from where we look at these dark sides. And in the perspective of Christian faith, we have this wonderful possibility to know that we do not have to fear this look at the dark side. That we do not have to fear to go in self-distance to ourselves even though we might discover something pretty not so nice things. Why? Because we are grounded in Christ. Because we know that it's not that we are such great people that we are loved. But we know we are loved by grace alone. Accepted by grace alone. I don't know what could be more wonderful as a basis for life. We do not have to perform. We do not have to make. We do not have to be good people all the time and have a moral account that's so high that even God might accept us. That's what Luther fought against. That's what he thought he had to deliver. And then he discovered this beautiful passage in Paul saying something that might at first sight sound strange and dogmatic or whatever, justified not by works but by faith alone. It's the liberation of every life to know this. Because you do not have to deliver and you do not have to be a great person before God loves you. God loves you anyway. And that is what makes you love other people and not the other way around. That is why you can repent. Now, if you look at modern happiness research, which is being done by people uh, or on people who in many cases are not Christians, are not religious, are so-called secular people. And when the happiness researchers look at what the questions are that people struggle with and what is the basis for happiness, one of the things they come up with is uh, an advice saying, learn to forgive. Even for secular people, they understand that this is actually a basis for happiness. That you can, first of all, look at your own faults and then forgive others because you know that you need forgiveness from others as well. Now think back to what I said about the marriages. If you're able to live this way, there's a great promise for you to, be, to lead a happier life. You cannot functionalize it for happiness. But it might be good to remind everybody of how wonderful these religious, these theological bases for life are for people today who always think that they don't need these things. Now, if you read on page 97 of your happiness advice book that you find in all bookstores here, you know, 10 steps to become a happy person. <laughs> and on page 97, you might read, well, learn to forgive, learn to be self-critical and all these things. So you read that uh, in the evening at 11 o'clock as your last thing uh, before you go to bed and then the next morning at 6 or 7 you wake up and say, from today on I will forgive. Same thing, live thankfully. They also say the next morning from today on I will live thankfully. It doesn't work. Because it's not a thing that you can put in your head. It needs a practice. You need to grow into it. It needs to enter your soul. 
And that's the beautiful thing with the biblical texts and the theology that I just talked about. If you read the Psalms on forgiveness, if you read the words of Jesus on forgiveness, on the Balkan in your eye, uh, the, the, the beam. beam, thank you. My wife is American. She is. <laughs> okay. I just said it louder. Okay. Uh, the beam, don't look at the splitter splinter in the eyes of your neighbor, but look at your own beam in your own eye. Those texts, those images, they enter your heart. And if you read them every day, if, if they're part of your life practice every day, that is when you change. Not because you read on page 97 that you should be a person who forgives. You need a practice. And that is the great strength of Christian faith. It gives you language. It gives you practice for, for these things. So repentance is everything but an old-fashioned word. Maybe the word is not so popular anymore. But we need to explain it to people and make them understand that repentance is one of the bases of a, of a happy life, of a fulfilled life. And when I talk about repentance, sin is not far. Again, such an expression, where you think today, sin, ooh, I better not talk about it. And, and many, many people uh, think of uh, diet sins first, or parking sins, or something like that. Uh, or maybe, if it's worse, they think of sexuality as sinful, which is completely nonsense. God has given us sexuality as a gift. It's wonderful. It's right to be very careful, to know how vulnerable we are when we engage in sexuality. That is right. That's so it's, it's good that there are ethical dimensions in it also named. But sexuality itself is not bad, it's not sinful. And that is the whole trap that's, that, that has piled up in church history around the expression of sin. What is sin really? Listen to Martin Luther. He has a, he's had a lot of problems. By the way, repentance. I think 500 years later, Martin Luther would have found a lot of things in his writings that he would repent for. So, yes, uh, what he wrote against the Jews, I cannot imagine. With everything he wrote on love, I will quote him later on that. Um, looking at 500 years of persecution of Jews, looking at the last century where six million Jews were murdered for, by Germans, how could Martin Luther not understand how terrible it was what he wrote 500 years ago? So Martin Luther has the basis to look critically at his own theology. Now, when he talks about sin, I think there's no reason to repent for him because he still has the best definition of sin that I know. Homo incurvatus in se ipsum, the Latin word. Human being incurved in itself, in him or herself. So the, the, it's, uh, sin is an, a relationship expression. It's not something that's in my natural being or something that I cannot get rid of. But sin is simply that I I'm not reaching out to God or to my neighbor. I, I'm incurved in myself. I, I circle around myself. That is sin. And now, if you look at what we discuss these days, at least in Germany, we talk about echo chambers. And I'm not sure whether everybody understands what this means. It's the internet communication. Uh, and we have blisters of communication in the sense that uh, in Facebook, which I use too, I have a Facebook page, so I'm not against that, but, but the dangers are there. The algorithms uh, make communication to be a communication of a certain community that always uh, affirms the same things. So that's what we call echo chamber in the internet. Now look at the definition of Martin Luther. That's exactly what he talks about. Human being, homo incovatus in se ipso. You do not reach out to the other anymore. Maybe to the strange anymore. 
to people who think completely different, who live in different worlds. But you circle around yourself. That's the danger of those modern internet algorithms in communication. So, one example, how timely this definition is. Another example for me, very timely, unfortunately, is the plural of this definition of sin. I kind of just changed it uh, to the plural. Communio in corvata in se ipsum. I think there's also communities incurved in themselves. Communities who circle around themselves, think they are the greatest and others are either bad or are basically neglectable. It's a narcissistic image of nations, sometimes also promoted by narcissistic people. That is the definition of sin by Martin Luther, incurved in yourself. So nationalism is an expression of sin for me. Nationalism is a sin. Because not patriotism, love your own country and uh, rejoice in other people loving their country and be brothers and sisters, not that. But nationalism is putting your own nation higher than others. And as Christians, we all know that this is in deep contradiction to everything we believe in. Because we believe that every human being is created by God, is created in the image of God. So how could we speak about other nations, about, about, about other human, human beings in that way? It's in covata, communo, communio in covata in se ipsum. Maybe you understand now why this definition of sin by Martin Luther is so timely and has such strong public uh, dimensions. Uh, if you go into the public realm and talk about nation from a Christian point of view, you know very well that taking repentance seriously means that also as a nation you need to look at your dark sides. You need to de develop a remembrance culture that does not try to put aside or even forget the dark sides of your history. And I know what I'm talking about as a German. That is why in Germany, and that is something I am very happy about, that in Germany, all over the place, in all the cities, all the villages, we have these plates and we have, we have uh, memorials uh, where we now see where Jews were transported away, were deported from these places. Uh, and uh, and uh, have these places that remind us of this dark side of our own history. That's the only way to look in the future when you include the dark sides of your own history in your account of this history. And um, it shows, again, it shows how timely these old expressions are, but we need to translate them. That is, that is the main task. Every time I talk about this theme in Germany, people afterwards are completely surprised how uh, relevant these old expressions are. That is what we have to do as theologians, uh, to explain and make, make these things accessible to people of today. And I've already talked about justification by grace alone. Let me just give you uh, one other example uh, only to think about uh, for how relevant this is. Look at the gods that try to punish us, that try to sometimes even destroy us today. Like Martin Luther, Luther uh, experienced God as the, the, the angry God that wants to destroy me. Think of what the pressures are today. You need to be successful, you need to have money, uh, you need to be always happy, always cool, even though, though you don't feel that way. And then also, you need to be beautiful. A certain beauty ideal can be a god that destroys you. Young girls are starving themselves to death because they are tortured by this modern god. And I'll think of what it would mean if we all could understand that in our soul that we are all justified by grace alone, not by following 
good works to the God of beauty. Just by grace alone. We can simply be. We do not have to make. We do not have to deliver. We can simply be. I think it couldn't be more timely than this. And it's for many young people. I repeat, it can be a matter of life and death. So let's not give up these old things. Let's explain them to people today. That is maybe the most important task for reforming theology. Now, freedom, another word that is more popular. So the danger is maybe, by, is, is maybe exactly the opposite. It's so popular and used so much that it can mean anything. So the task of theology there is to try to give it a more precise meaning. And of course that is something that is uh, maybe the most well-known theme of Martin Luther because of this beautiful treatise on liberty, on Christian liberty of 1520. I think it's still one of the most beautiful works of theology in, in church history. Uh, that's how far I go. Uh, it's not in each passage easy to read, but it, it fits exactly the core of what we're called to do when we, when we develop theology. Uh, and uh, the basis of it is his understanding of freedom. And uh, you might uh, know the, the first two, um, the first two uh, um, um, uh, sentences, the theses that uh, Martin Luther put at the beginning of his uh, treatise. A Christian is a perfectly free lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject of all, subject to all. Now you might say, well, these two things are contradictory, but they aren't. Subject to none simply means because I know that God loves me, God goes with me every day, I have an inner strength and I have a guide, an orientation that is uh, forming my own conscience that is so strong that I do not have to fear external authorities. I do not have to subject to certain contents, to certain uh, 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 words that are put onto myself from outside that I'm supposed to believe if I know they're wrong. I do not have to su subject to, to be subordinate to such external authority, but I can follow my conscience. Obviously, this is what, uh, what is at the core, historical core of Reformation. Martin Luther stood before the emperor uh, and uh, before the envoyee of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the pope. And he said, um, here I stand is probably not what he said, but again, one of those sayings. Um, uh, if you cannot convince me that what you're asking me to say is based in scriptures, I cannot revoke. He did not fear the external authority because he was firm in his spiritual basis in Christ. So this is inner freedom. And it's the freedom from subjecting to be subordinate, uh, from being subordinate to external, external authorities. Very timely, of course, again, because we need civil courage against leaders who are unjust leaders. And we need to speak up even though it might cause some disadvantages for, for us. That is basically the reason why we are all here right now because people in the former German Democratic Republic until 1989, this was part of the communist part of Germany, uh, which was, no matter what one thinks about uh, socialism and all these things, which was a dictatorship. And people could not tell their opinion. And people did tell their opinion because they were based in Christ. It was a spiritual movement, it was a Christian movement uh, that, was, that started the revolution, the peaceful revolution in the German Democratic Republic, which 
led to the fall of the Berlin Wall and to the fall of the, uh, of the uh, barbed wire and shooting installation uh, um, uh, border that I grew up with when I was uh, a boy. So the reason why we sit here is, is that Martin Luther had followers in the East German peace movement who started the, uh, the revolution. Civil courage is crucial. In many countries far from here, not Germany itself, it is very costly to tell your opinion. And also in Germany there are situations where you have to speak up and might face disadvantages. So this is the first part of freedom. You have an inner freedom to speak up and follow your conscience. And the second part is that freedom always means to serve others. Our modern understanding of freedom is very much formed by increasing and optimizing your options. If I have 10 possibilities of choice to develop my life, then I'm free rather than having one or two. Now this optimization of the number of choices is not what Christian freedom is all about. Christian freedom means the love of God enters your heart and makes it so full that it flows over to your neighbor. And freedom in this sense means commitment to others, commitment to the community, commitment to civil society, commitment to the common good. That is what, what freedom sets free, what inner freedom sets free as external freedom. And that is why, and that is a, another theme, faith and love, the relationship between faith and love in Re Reformation theology, especially in Luther, is so crucial. Again and again, the, especially people in the Catholic tradition have misunderstood what Martin Luther said about works. They thought that if works are not uh, the basis of justification, works are less important. The opposite is the case. Because works are even more precious if they come from your inner will rather than from trying to score somehow. And that is what Martin Luther described. And I, I will read to you my favorite quote of Luther. I tried to quote it as many times as possible in this Reformation anniversary, hoping that maybe then everybody can say it by heart. <laughs> uh, I, uh, uh, I know it more in German than in English, that's why I read it now. Um, from faith, from faith, thus flow forth love and joy in the Lord. I love this. Lust, Lust in German. Sie so fließt aus dem Glauben die Liebe und die Lust zu Gott. Normally God is always something, you know, uh, you look up to, uh, but lust, you know, lust, uh, joy of God. That is what Luther means, not some God who tells me what to do or something. So I, I say it again. Um, from faith thus flow forth love and joy in the Lord, and from love a joyful, willing, and free mind that serves one's neighbor willingly. And it continues, uh, uh, beautiful uh, words afterwards, but uh, for the time I, I, I'm stopping here. Uh, I just want to quote this to show that love is the natural consequence of faith. That is the reason and I've been asked in many interviews, especially in the last uh, weeks, about the political dimension of faith. Uh, why do I talk to Merkel and Obama if they're politicians? Why do we, uh, why do we speak up publicly in certain political issues? I always say, we don't have a choice. How could we not speak about these things? Because this is what Luther said. From faith flows love. And if we take this seriously, that there is no faith without love to our neighbor, then of course we must be affected by the misery of people, by the emergencies, by, by, by the suffering of our brothers and sisters, often in other parts of the world, but also here. 
How could we not suffer with them? If we take seriously that we are called to love our neighbor. And of course the neighbor is not our neighbor at the house, besides our house. The neighbor is a universal neighbor. That's why we call people, when you go in other countries of the world, other continents, we call them you brothers and sisters. So how could we not care for how they are? And everybody who looks at reality seriously sees immediately that the condition of people all over the world is highly shaped by political decisions, by political structures. Now how could I pray for my neighbor in Rwanda or in South Africa or in Tanzania, countries that I'm very much connected with? How could I pray for my neighbor and not care for climate change, knowing yeah, I should probably say that now because I don't have so much time anymore. <laughs> Knowing, climate change was a chapter at the end, but I, I, I say it now. Knowing that those who have, have the least caused climate change are those who suffer most from it. And uh, when I speak to politicians about it, just a few days ago I had, I had the chance uh, to talk to Angela Merkel, the Chancellor on Africa, for a few hours. And of course, you simply need to, to say the numbers of CO2 emission worldwide. You know that CO2 emission is the cause for climate change. Uh, and when I, maybe, maybe that anecdote, when I uh, go through Tanzania with the, the presiding bishop of the Tanzanian Lutheran Church, one of the, the, the biggest churches in the Lutheran World Federation, six million people, he shows me the burnt grass, the burnt fields. And he, show, he, he tells me these fields were development projects. But now the weather extremities have become so bad that it's all destroyed. Now how can I not take these stories home? And then look at the numbers. 16.3 tons per capita per year CO2 emission by the USA. 9.3, now it's actually 10 tons. Last year was a, a little increase. 10 tons per capita annually in Germany. 4 tons per capita annually is the average, average worldwide. 2 tons per capita annually is what could still be possible without going to heat up the atmosphere more than 2 degrees. That's 1.5 to 2 degrees is in the Paris summit is the, the goal to limit climate change. To, in order to achieve this, the average CO2 emission per capita annually would be 2 tons. Now Tanzania has 0 0.1 tons and Rwanda has 0 0.05 tons. Do you have to add anything? Not really. The justice problem is absolutely on the table. And it is clear that ecology and justice can never be separated. And then of course it means that at the places where the power is, where, is, where the decisions are made on the future shape of the world by trying to find or not find ways to limit climate change, of course there is being decided whether it's being decided how we deal with our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world and of course also with future generations. There's no reason not to include those into our double commandment of love. So I simply don't understand it how somebody could say we could be unpolitical. Of course not everybody can read the newspaper from page one to page, uh, final page every day. Not everybody can be competent and I do not expect for everybody to engage politically or become a member of a party or something. But to programmatically exclude being political from the task of the church simply doesn't make sense to me. If anybody can explain it to me afterwards, I would be very happy. Uh, I might not be convinced, but I might. I'm always open to, to new ideas. Uh, but I do not understand it, how you could not be political when you know that the shape of your neighbor
depends on political decisions. So faith and love uh, can never be separated. When I say that people who are Christians, pious people, must be political. I've always said, many times said in German, wer fromm ist, muss auch politisch sein. A little bit provocative. Whoever is pious must be political. Um, not party political, but political in the sense I just explained. Now, if that is true, of course, we have to reflect upon how we do this. So for me, the question is not whether we can be political or public. The question, the question is how can we do it? Because of course we cannot simply transfer a biblical commandment from two or three thousand years ago into our reality today and think we have resolved the problems. So that is too easy. That is why Martin Luther has developed a lot of thoughts also on that question. And um, the expression that is most uh, uh, speaking about this is the, the expression of the two kingdoms doctrine. Some of you might have heard about this. Uh, the two kingdoms doctrine of Martin Luther that has often been misused to say religion belongs to the, the spiritual kingdom and in the temporal kingdom, which is where politics happens, Religion should be kept out in the sense that uh, we should not try to speak to the political realm from, a, from a, a Christian faith basis. There is some truth to it, but there is also uh, a grave misunderstanding uh, in this. Martin Luther has indeed made the, uh, the distinction between the temporal and the spiritual authority and he says the commandments of the Sermon on the Mount, for example, to give freely, to not respond with, with, uh, with force when you are being treated uh, by, with violence. Um, these commandments, he says, cannot be directly put into, uh, into practice in the temporal realm. And that makes sense. I think everybody is quite happy to be able to call the police when he or she is threatened uh, and especially if you cannot decide it yourself. Martin Luther would say, as a Christian yourself, you can suffer. You can suffer without striking back. That is a whole extra question. Uh, when should you do what? But what he talks about is if you have responsibility for others, if you have responsibility for children, if you have responsibility for old people, for people who cannot, uh, who cannot uh, really uh, resist to an injustice that is being done. But also you could apply it to people who are in danger of being victim of genocide. Can you, can you really say, well, the Sermon on the Mount says you should not resist evil. Wouldn't it be cynical to do that? So apparently there is reason to think about how we as Christians can deal with situations where we have responsibilities for others who are in danger, who might be killed, who might be even killed in masses. That's why his thought is very relevant and it's, it's very timely. He says in the temporal realm you need to think about with with your reason, you, th you need to think about how you, how you can limit the violence best. And some people said, well, in the temporal realm, apparently you use reason and the gospel doesn't have anything to do with that. That is wrong, because Luther never separated the two kingdoms. Never said spiritual kingdom and temporal kingdom. This is where the police gets really violent in order to fight against... Uh, uh, people, if you allow me, I don't know whether there's somebody uh, from the Philippines here. I think, I'm sorry to say, of your president. Yeah. He is, uh, he is calling to kill drug dealers. Uh, and, he, 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 and thousands of people have been killed, murdered, because they're not being punished. 
because the president said we need to be really tough on these, uh, on these people, so we kill them. Then we have resolved the problem. He could not be based on Martin Luther's two kingdoms doctrine. Because of course it's the same God who reigns both kingdoms. God does not only reign the spiritual kingdom, God also reigns the temporal kingdom. And God's love might have different expressions, forms, but it's still God love, God's love also in the temporal kingdom. So the only question is how can you put, how can you react to God's love in the temporal kingdom in an appropriate way? I think the answer is clear. You need to minimize violence. You might have to use force or even violence. For example, to protect people from genocide, you might to use military force. I know that there are different opinions on that, but I believe after the Rwanda case, where, where, one, where uh, United Nations soldiers have stood by when 1,800,000 to 1 million people were murdered with knives, with machetes, because they were not allowed to use their weapon, rather, uh, except when they were attacked themselves for self-defense. They had order not to use their weapons. So 800,000 people were killed. And I, I personally, as a Christian, say never again. And, and if, if something like that happens, there must be the possibility for soldiers to protect those people who are being slaughtered. Just as an example to show how difficult this is. But at the same time, of course, military violence has to be questioned. Because in many, most cases, it has led to even more violence. So you need to think, with Luther, you need to think about how you minimize violence. And that means that violence can only be an ultima ratio. It can never be blessed or anything. So uh, that is the reflection by Martin Luther on how you deal with it in the, how you deal with uh, politics in the temporal kingdom. And uh, let me just give you one more example. I've used the example of using violence, but, but a really impressive example is Luther's Ethics of Economics. How many of you know that Luther has written several books on Ethics of Economics? One, two, three, four, four and a half? Uh, okay. Uh, it's at least a pretty small minority, which reflects the general situation. It's a mystery to me why we have whole libraries on uh, law and gospel, on uh, the, the last things, on eschatology and all kinds of things, on justification. Uh, it's great that many books have been written, but why is there so little on eth Luther's ethics of economics? Just to give you uh, an idea of why this is not a good uh, 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 situation, Karl Marx, in his famous book, Das Kapital, The Capital, Karl Marx quoted Luther more than any other German uh, 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 economist or theologian. And in most cases, uh, in a positive sense. That all, already leads the direction. Martin Luther was one of the most vivid anti-capitalist polemics that, uh, that uh, we know from the 16th century. Uh, he spoke from a more conservative point of view. He wanted to protect the old feudal order because he thought that everybody was cared for in this order. Now he finds, he sees this new way of doing economics where everything goes via market. And he says, how can a merchant take a price just according to the market? How can a merchant take as much money for his good as he can? rather than as he should. Because he says, if he does so, he doesn't care about his neighbor. He doesn't care about how the person who needs to buy the good, whether they have the money for it, whether they really, really desperately need it, and, uh, and maybe go in debt in order to get it. Take the example of bread. If he needs to buy bread, he needs bread. And then the merchant takes as much as he can. And if there's too little bread, he takes a lot of money because he, he profits from the, 
from the suffering of his neighbor. Martin Luther said, that's not how it can work, how economy can work. Uh, there should be a, an idea of how we can sell goods in a way that respects the, the, um, authority, respects the, the needs of your neighbor. Of course, today, after 500 years, we cannot simply uh, put this uh, notion of just price uh, into practice today. There are good reasons for market mechanisms today. I would affirm that. But they must be put in a framework so they are not at the cost of the weakest members of society. But they must be put in a framework so that this market mechanism is something that the weakest members profit from as well. If it generates wealth, and there's good reason to believe that market mechanisms generate wealth, we must make sure that the weakest member, the most poor members of society, profit from it as well. That is, I think, the intention of Martin Luther. And here's some, I'll give you just a, a, a quote so you understand how challenging uh, Luther's words are at many places. Kings and princes, uh, he, he, he uh, enumerates 12 practices of multinational corporations of his time. They were already there then. It was the time of the first globalization in the six, 16th century. And it was the fuggers and the, he calls them the societies, the, the, the trade societies, the trade associations. Uh, and uh, we would call them now multinational corporations today. Uh, and, he, and he talks about monopolies. He talks about speculation on the, on the market and these things. We know it all. And then he says, kings and princes ought to look into this matter and forbid them by strict laws. But I hear that they have a finger in it themselves. And the saying of Isaiah is fulfilled. Your princes have become companions of thieves. They hang thieves who have stolen a golden or half a golden, but do business with those who rob the whole world and steal more than all the rest. So that the proverb remains true. Big thieves hang little thieves. As the Roman Senator Cato said, simple thieves lie in dungeons and sticks. Public thieves walk abroad in gold and silk. <laughs> pretty, pretty tough. I would probably get a, a, a trial for that, like a, 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 a suit, a, a law. I would be suited for, for something like that, for insult. So um, Martin Luther was very passionate. That is what I want to say. On, on, on the option for the poor in the economy. And I hope that throughout this anniversary year, and I try again, also this theme, I try to talk about it as much as possible, so it enters people's heads that Martin Luther was an, uh, an ethic, uh, ethicist of economics. How can this theory that Martin Luther wanted us to keep out of politics and economy and all these things, how could that theory be true if he writes one book after the other I mean, several books on ethics of economics. And if you read them, you, can, you have very special and very careful, uh, pragmatic proposals that he makes for the economy. So it, I think it is clear that uh, Luther was a public theologian. If I had another hour, I would now uh, tell you uh, what I think uh, how public theology works and how we can uh, speak publicly responsib uh, responsibly, um, but uh, I will not uh, do that now. Maybe it's enough to quote um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer at the end, to simply describe the task and the necessity of public theology. I think a very impressive quote. In his ethics, he writes, in flight of public controversy, this person or that reaches the sanctuary of a private virtuousness. Such people neither steal nor murder nor commit adultery, but do good according to their abilities. But in voluntary renouncing public life, these people know exactly how to observe the permitted boundaries that shield them from conflict. They must close their eyes and ears to the injustice around them, only at the cost of self-deception can they keep their private blamelessness clean from the stains of responsible action in the world. That is why we need reforming theology. Uh, that's why we need a public theology. 
that contributes to the big task of society to create a life of dignity for each person in this world. Thank you.